So what happens when we get these specialty holes that are going on? Keep in mind, we've got some here. We've got a blind hole. We've got a through hole, certain dimensioning techniques, right? If a hole is dimensioned where there is no depth given, it's a through hole. It just goes completely through the object, so we don't get depth. We've got a blind hole. We do get depth in the note. Then we come into counterboard, countersink, spot face, and then down lower. I don't think I got it shown. Oh, here it is right here. Your threaded hole, which they don't have the dimension on. We can go to chapter 19 for that, where we're dealing with those thread notes, be it English or metric. What do we do with these specialty holes? Now, the reason I say this is because our caveat with all holes is if I have a negative cylinder, where should I put the dimensional information or the size dimension for it? I've got a negative cylinder. Where do I put the size information? In the circular view for a negative hole, right? Because I don't want a dimension to hidden lines. If I have a positive cylinder, where is the size information? Rectangular view. Rectangular view, because that's our best geometric look at. Where is all of our location dimensions for either one of these? Generally in the circular view, okay? because that's where we see the best look at a center mark. So we locate both of them in the circular view, we size based on negative or positive. Now there is an exception. When we have a negative cylinder, which should be sized in the circular view, and then we show it in section, we then dimension them as positive cylinders or in the rectangular view, right? That and that's shown in several figures that we've already talked about in chapter 17. Now, that is for a general whole. When you get to these types of holes, I think one other thing you need to bring into the equation is your three C's. Because remember, all these dimensioning things, they're guidelines, right? We've got 57 of them in our handout. We've got 13 in our text where they say, go through and do this and do this and do this and do this. Are you going to come across objects where you can't do any of those? Yeah. Yeah, you most certainly are. Okay, and that's where we come back to that statement hours, you draw back 10 and punt, right? We don't know what to do. And so we're going to figure it out. Always go back to the three C's, folks. I mean, we said this right in the first week of this class, and we're going to say it on the last week. The drawing should be clear, should be concise, and should be complete. You are not going to get some of these things to be very clear. Case in point, is this problem that you have, which is 4B, I believe. Um, I feel that this was a couple of you this morning. But let's look at this guy. When we're dealing with these holes, these are all special holes. So in essence, what we have right here is we have a counterboard, countersink. I think this one technically by the author is meant to be a spot face, but you can measure that and you can guess it. So it could be a counter more. You could give depth on it. Okay. But in essence, we have three holes. Now, none of these are threaded. Okay. So we, they're not threaded holes, but they could be. And so case in point here, we could even have more information that needs to go with the size information. Remember, these are all done with leader lines in here. We should locate in what? the circular view. So how would we dimension this character? How would we dimension? Kind of look at it for a second and see what you think. Keep in mind, you got a front and a top. So here we have width height. Here we have width depth. When you're doing this, I would suggest always do your location dimensions first. So following our guidelines, where should the location dimensions be? Front or top view? Top view, right, David? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, it should be here. So let's kind of sketch these in. 
And I would kind of sketch on this stuff. So let's say we come in and we're going to, let's try and keep them all on the same side just to start with. So let's say we've got this guy, this guy, this guy. Um, we're going to locate here. Our, am I going to use chain dimensioning or am I going to use datum dimensioning? Okay, so if I do chain, that's where I'm stacking them like this. But remember, now I have tolerance stack up. So you could decide to do it there and then pull the second one and do it there versus this one. Okay, and then the next one there if you felt that was important. But be that as it may, here's your depth location, correct? Okay. Now let's deal with the width. Let's turn this guy. I'll try not just to step on that and fall. <laughs> so let's just kind of look at this one here. Let's do the same thing. So we'll come over. And whether you go chain, chain or datum, it's the same deal. Okay. So say we put those here. Okay. Now, I put them in between because I know, hey, I'm going to try and put them in the circular view and I need associative dimensioning, right? Or in between my views which is technically here. Now, where do I now put the size information? They're negative cylinders. So they should probably go in the top view, correct? Yeah. Okay. So let's say we pull this guy. Remember, you don't want to go through a corner, so I don't want to pull here. So you're probably not going to pull these at 45. We always go to the leader line on the outside object line. That's always where it points to. And we do the main hole first, so diameter XX, and then let's say this is just a spot face. Okay, so I'll just do that in diameter and no depth on that one. That's where that one can go. I do have a little room right here. I can pull this one here. Okay, so this is the diameter XX, counterbore, diameter X, depth. Okay, so that's where that information is going to go. Okay, now I get to this guy. Where are we going to put it? Go up with that. Yeah, can we go up? Now, technically, associative, we would want to keep it somewhere in this zone, but you're going to have to cross all this stuff. Because okay. remember, we need one more dimension here. We do have to get the overall. Okay. So we've still got this guy sitting down here, too. Okay. And I've also got, let me just add this one, I do want this overall right there. So, David, you're saying you'd pull it up top. Not, maybe not a bad choice. Can I pull it to the side? I'm getting pretty darn straight horizontal if I do that. I would probably agree with David and that I would pull it up here. Now, that's not associative. It's not grouping. So I'm not following those, but it does get there and it's got the information out there. Is that the correct way to do it? Well, the only other dimension we need is height. So again, that one would probably sit right here. That might be one way you do it. Now, let's complicate the process. Let's say that's our first guess. Now let's come in and decide, you know what? For my shape description, this is a classic offset section. It really is. Because I'm seeing all hidden lines down here. Is it clear? Is it easy to read? Yeah, okay, but it would look a lot better in section. So now if I section this guy, what happens then? These all go to object lines. So now we're sitting like this. Um, my cutting plane line is going to do something like this. Right here. So I'm doing an offset section. Now that immediately kicks in another guideline. Because now I'm showing my negative cylinders with object lines. And so we should then put the size dimension with this stuff. Now, can I come down here now and do, and let me just kind of erase them. We've, we've still got our location stuff probably sitting up here. But let me just kind of get a little room here. Let's go with green on this. So now I probably need that dimension. I need this dimension. Those are both diameters. 
right? Mm -hmm. okay. I need the depth. So if I decide that's not a spot face, well, I think we did decide it was a spot face. But if you went to the counterboard, you've got to get depth. Same thing would happen here. Okay, so that one's coming, this one's coming, and then I need to pull that dimension for depth. Now the problem gets to be, how do I deal with this guy? Because technically I need to dimension it. So it's either going to come diameter, diameter. Now how do I get that angle in there? The text shows a couple different ways. Technically what we want is this one, where I'm coming here, and I'm giving that angle, the full angle. I'll tell you right now, if you do this object, you aren't going to have the room. You start following this half inch off, three eighths off, this stuff's all going to be a total mess. It, it, nobody's going to be able to read it. So here's a case in point where is there a correct answer following the guidelines? Maybe not. I'm always going to make sure my drawing is clear. Now, be consistent, right? Because that's part of the three C's also. So the other thing I might think of is, though, even though these are in section, I'm still going to include my size information on here. And I would say only do this with specialty holes, folks. By that, counter bores, counter sinks, spot faces, threaded holes. Okay? And certainly a threaded hole, I am almost never doing in a rectangular view because I need a thread node. So I would probably at this point come in and get rid of all of this, still leave my size dimension on here, and then still show this in section. So in essence, I'm breaking one of the guidelines, which is a negative hole in section should be dimensioned as a positive cylinder in the rectangular view. And I'm breaking it based on clarity. Now, if you can make it fit, and it still looks good and is clear, easy to read, by all means, do it in that front view. But you're going to have to do some sketching to figure that stuff out. And there's a, certainly a huge gray area here. And I can't tell you which way is the right way, because it's really dependent on the object and your thought pattern when you go through it. Um, that, that, this is certainly an area that there's a lot of right answers. Okay. Use your, but the point of this whole exercise is use your guidelines to get you close. They're guidelines. They will not work for every object. At that point, you need to devolve back to those three C's. And what can I do to clarify this drawing? Hey, do I decide, oh, I'm not going to go with the section? Well, that's probably not the right choice because I'm, that's a great shape description. How do I give that size? You're going to have to make choices. Just look back, give it some thought, maybe discuss it with some of your peers, decide what you think is the best way to go, and then run with it. Always come back to, is it clear? Okay. Um, so with that said, I mean, certainly I, I hope I answered the question of the folks I talked to this morning. The rest of you, are there any other thoughts you want to weigh in with on this? Yes? The other way, we have to move down, is to, you know, you do them in a length, in line. Mm -hmm. um, you could, no, the line, because then you wouldn't be associated. Never mind, I'd say you could pull up one side and do all the, all the dimensioning one line, but it wouldn't be associated with it. No. Point being, we got a bunch of guidelines. Start there. They will not work with everything. All right, so I just wanted to kind of discuss that because this is one that I, I like this little problem because it makes us really think. And you might have to step outside your little comfort zone in these guidelines and trust your own thought pattern. 
Now certainly I understand, maybe I don't have construction experience, I don't know how these things are built, I, I've never talked to a machinist in my entire life, I've never talked to a carpenter, I don't know their building process, that's going to come with experience. Knowing your workforce, knowing who that reader is, these types of things. That's going to come down the road right, as you mature in the industry. But be that as it may, use those guidelines as a starting point, but you may have to deviate off of them. All right, that's no other questions on this stuff. Let's jump to some of your specialty shapes. Let's go to the handout first because there's one that's not in the text, it's only in the handout. So this is the handout I gave you from the Gusecki text. Do you have this one? If you don't have it, I'll give you a second to locate it. We're going to be on page 318. How do we dimension tapers? We get tapers in a lot of different places. And here's a case in point where the author gives you four of them. As a general rule, tapers are dimensioned on the center line. Okay, so that's what we kind of want to watch out for. Now, when we're dealing with tapers, okay, you can kind of see here's a nozzle okay, where we're taking something and coming through. And you know, there's a lot of misconceptions on what goes on with this, especially with fluids. And we do a lot of this with fluids. Because people will say, hey, I got this one diameter, I'm going to a small diameter, and I'm beefing up the pressure. No, what we're doing is we're speeding up the material, is all we're really doing. Pressure has nothing to do with it. But when we come through, well, how do you build these? Because it's a straight line. Okay. These tapers are all straight line. They're dealing with air, they're dealing with water, or fluids of some type. That's what we use these for, as a general rule. When you look at the dimension, you notice how they do it. They're doing this off the center line. They should have a center line in them. They give one diameter. It doesn't really matter which diameter you give, whether the small one or the large one. The author just shows them all with the large one. Then we must give the length of the taper. That's given here. And then we give the deviation from the center line. That's what this is right here. It's pointing to the outside object line since it's shown in section but it's a number four American National Standard taper. The machinists would then go to the machinery's handbook, they would look up this taper, and they're gonna get the angle of that cut. This is really probably the preferred way of doing it. Most tapers that I've seen and used, this is the way we always used to do them, where again, you give one diameter, you give the length, and then off of the center line, you give the angle and that allows them to do it. Here's another one that again goes to the machine and handbook. This one's using a gauge or a mechanical device that you would then put on it at certain inter intervals where they're giving again 1.5 to 1. These always have to be measured off the center line because that's the only constant point with these. So even though it doesn't look like that one is where it's got a taper of an eighth inch to one on that, that's really off of the center line. That's how we have to measure them to check them. So in essence, with tapers, give a diameter, give the length of taper, and the deviation from the center line. It can be an angle measurement, or it can be an XY deviation, like the third one on there, 0.125 to 1. So those are tapers. Can you kind of see that these are used out there? Can you recognize some of these shapes? Mm -hmm. If any of you are taking notes with a pencil, you might see one right in front of you. They certainly, in the aircraft industry, motorized any type of travel where we've got wind flow, anytime fluid flow, air flow, these types of things, you're probably going to be dealing with tapers of some 
type. Any questions on tape? Yes. Are we going to come across A a lot? Are we going to have to know how to use that in the book, in this thing? Or, or where is where That's actually the easiest way to do this. So where do you find that standard? Um, look in your index and look up tapers. Back in here. Okay. Yeah. No, in your machinery handbook. This one. Okay. Yes. So, okay. this guy. <laughs> I, I think in your appendix, I think we do have a couple tapers. I never looked this morning, but I think there is some taper charts in there. But in essence, I know there isn't. All right, now the other items we're talking about are certainly in your handout also, but your text has these also, so I want to go to your text. Let's look at chamfers. These are on page 830. When you're doing chamfers, 830, figure 1729. Here they're showing an internal chamfer or an external chamfer. Now, we kind of discussed this internal chamfer. This is a counterboard hole, right? Um, when we pull them in section, we should do them this way. This is the way we would go with our guidelines, go to here first, where we're given the diameter and the angle of cut. Now, if this is another hole that comes through here, I kind of don't like this setup because this is being dimensioned somewhere else. And again, it should probably be right here. If we were really pulling this in section, you would have one more that would sit right there. And that's your internal chamfer. Now, they do give you this one where you can come off of here for room. Okay. Keep in mind, this would be the preferred, the full angle. So that's an internal chamfer. We already discussed that a little bit. Your external chamfer is shown here. Now, you can give it one leg of the triangle, angle, sloped surface, right? Even though it's on a circular device. And we already talked about the ways to do an angled surface that you can give one leg of the triangle or the angle, or you can give both legs of the triangle, which is done here. Now, it's too small, most of these, to get this. I almost always deviate to that one right there, especially on a small chamfer, where I use a leader line. I point to the chamfer, and I'm giving the X and Y offsets or both legs of the triangle. Okay. And that's what you're seeing there, is the x, y. So what that's saying is, you're going to come from this corner, and I'm going to go two units this way, I'm going to go two units that way, I find that point, that point, and I chop it off. Okay. You can also give this one, one leg of the triangle and the angle. That's identical to this, it's just included in a leader line. When you're doing these small chamfers, folks, go to that leader line. I'll just tell you right now, that's the way you're going to want to do them. If you have a big chamfer or an angled surface, I would probably do this, do an X, Y, but I can use an angle also. The chamfers. Any questions on those? Okay. We already talked about slots. Does anybody have any questions on slots down here? Okay, so I'll just leave that one. Next one's keyways. Now, first off, let me ask a question. How many people have heard of the term keyway, key seat? See a show of hands? It's about standard, we've got three of you. Okay, so maybe we ought to talk about what a keyway or a key seat is. Okay. Um, they're a, really a connection device and they are used to protect items. Okay, so the key seat is this one, it goes in a shaft. The keyway, which is shown here, goes in what we call a collar. Okay. Now, what do we mean by a shaft and a collar? Yeah, I've got some here. So this would be considered a collar, this middle part right here. Okay. 
Now, if I look at this up close, and I'll get to it in a second, you're going to see a keyway in this one. It's used to connect this device to it. Okay. This is what's called a shaft. Okay. So they're basically fit together like such. And how we join them is when I take that little keyway, let me kind of line them up here. Okay, and I'll pass this around so you can see it. It's right there. Okay, we'll put them in and it creates a little rectangle. <coughs> now I put a piece of metal down in there that will be halfway into this device, halfway into this device. Generally that item we put in there is called a key. Okay, hence the keyway, key seat. If, as these turn, they both have to turn together. The reason we use these is it connects them together, but it protects this device right here. And to give you a, a little analogy, it kind of shocked me the first time I ever saw this. These things right here are way expensive. Okay, way expensive. In fact, I did a project once, an EBAP project, and I bought a bunch of 1,000 horsepower pumps for them. The pumps were a quarter million piece. We had one break, and we had to replace the pump. And what it did is it snapped the shaft. Okay, so we went to buy a new shaft for it. These things cost 250 grand a piece. The shaft alone was $230,000. The pump was only 20 grand. The shaft was the whole cost. So what we want to do is we want to protect this thing. And so what we want is as it's turning, something catches on this guy, something hits, we want the key to break. So that this starts freewheeling, it stops working, but this is a saved device. It's now not broken. Okay? That's what we use them for. Um, those of you that have done 